Lab-grown diamonds are relatively new in Australia. In America, they've been around longer. So to get a perspective on what the more mature market looks like, let's hear from Paul Zemniski, who's an independent diamond industry analyst. So this really started to take off, I would say, almost uh, 10 years ago. Um, it's been primarily distributed in the U.S. So the U.S. is the largest consumer market for diamonds. Uh, more than half of, if we just look at total diamond jewelry demand, comes out of the U.S. So this has kind of been unfolding, uh, I, I would say, on a, on a more mainstream level since maybe 2016, 2017. And then just if we, if we look at, you know, 2021, 2022, we got to the point where, you know, lab-grown diamond as a product was pretty mainstream in the U.S. You could find it at, at, at most, you know, jewelry stores or retailers that deal on that type of jewelry. The price has come down quite significantly over the years because it's a manufactured product and the production technologies are getting better and the capacity to produce them is getting larger. So the, you know, on, on a relative basis, the prices have been coming down. So it kind of went from a product that maybe represented 1% of total diamond jewelry sales maybe 10 years ago. Today, it's approaching 20%. So it's grown at a, a pretty rapid clip, but natural diamonds still represent the majority of diamonds sold globally. And that, that growth, is that leveling off now? I think in the US, it's starting to level off. The product seems to be re, you know, reaching a much more mature level prices continue to differentiate from that of, you know, natural diamonds. So I think consumers are, you know, starting to view it as maybe less substitutable. And I, yeah, I just, I think some of the excitement, some of the, the, the fad is, has run its course, given that the product's been out for um, quite some time. Cormac Kinney is more bearish than Paul about lab-grown diamonds. But full disclosure, his business, Diamond Standard, trades natural diamonds, not the lab-grown ones, as commodities. He's very bullish about natural diamonds, not about the lab-grown ones. It's already peaked and now it's starting to fall. So with a lab-grown diamond, the marginal cost of producing it rapidly approaches zero. And so as they became popular, the producers started manufacturing them 24 hours a day. And initially, they were priced relative to natural, about a 30% discount. Now today, five years later, the wholesale spread between a natural diamond and a synthetic diamond is about 99%, meaning that it's a 99% discount for synthetic. However, when that diamond gets to the jewelry store, the retailers are very slow to lower their prices. So historically, a retailer might have marked up a natural diamond by 15 to 30%. They're marking up synthetic diamonds by 200 to 1,000 percent. And more and more consumers here in the United States are getting offers to buy lab-grown diamonds directly. And they're seeing that they're hundreds of dollars per carat and not thousands and thousands of dollars. So recently, there's been a lot of articles about women, especially trying to trade in lab-grown diamonds because they know they're wearing something that represents their marriage that only is worth about $128. And they don't like that. So we're seeing a resurgence, but also the retailers have learned a valuable lesson that there's a difference between margin and profit. You may have a very high margin on a small component of the sale, but their overall sales volume has collapsed. So we think that we're seeing already the beginning of a return to normalcy for natural diamonds. Because um, Pandora, which are a global brand, they announced a while ago they were only gonna use the lab-grown diamonds. Are you saying that is not working out for them? No, no, that's working out tremendously. So that's what you can expect. The companies that were historically selling $30 jewelry, that's crystals like Swarovski or Pandora, they're going to continue to sell lab-grown diamonds, and it's much more beautiful. But Tiffany's, for example, Cartier, they never sold a lab-grown diamond. And what I'm expecting is that all of the mid-tier real jewelry stores are going to start to phase out synthetic diamonds and return to natural so that they can now capitalize on that customer walking in instead of making a $1,200 sale, they can make a $6,000 sale. Won't that be resisted because of cost of living pressures? We've we've really got them here in Australia. I I imagine you've got them there too. That's true. Uh, But diamonds are a luxury good. And that's what's growing by 6%. So 
the rich have gotten richer than ever, ever since the beginning of COVID, in large part because the government's print money handed out with a trickle down theory and rich people don't spend it. They save it, they invest it, or they buy luxury goods. So luxury goods uh, at the higher end, like Louis Vuitton and, and, and Tiffany's, are still doing very, very well. And that's the market for natural diamonds. We're not trying to sell to the consumer or, you know, diamonds in general are not being sold to the consumer deciding, am I going to pay my rent or am I going to buy a, a pair of earrings? Paul Zimniski, what do you think? Isn't cost of living enough of an issue to drive some of the markets towards lab-grown diamonds? Maybe. Um, again, I think it's important to remember that we don't need any diamonds, right? So it's a, it's a, it's a luxury purchase. It's a, it's a discretionary purchase. Um, historically, diamonds have been a, a Veblen good, which is an economic term, meaning the higher the price, the more desired they become. Um, so again, it's not really a, a rational purchase from a consumer standpoint. So I'm sure there's some of that going on, but I don't see that as the main driving force. So what is likely to happen to the price of lab-grown diamonds over the next year or so? It's hard to predict in the short term. What I could say is that production capacity still continues to grow and the ability to produce larger, higher quality uh, lab-grown diamonds seems to continuously improve. Um, so I think both of those will allow for lower prices in the future. Um, and I would note that there are certainly companies in the, in the lab-grown diamond industry that you know, are aiming to produce diamond for use in high-tech applications like computer processing, electric vehicle applications, storage applications. And in order to do that uh, in, a, in a scalable way, they really have to get the price of the raw material lower before it would become economic in a lot of these high-tech industries. So I think that means that the industry is going to continue to look for ways to be able to lower the production costs. And I think um, you're going to see that on the jewelry side of the market as well. On that jewelry side, is part of the price differential between naturally made diamonds, if I could put it that way, that take thousands of years, and the ones that are made in a lab, is part of it just that people know it's come from a lab and so it, it just doesn't, feel the same? You know, it's a luxury product and, and luxury isn't always a, a practical or a logical purchase. We buy it because it makes us feel a certain way. It makes us feel good. It's really a study in, in consumer psychology. And I guess I would equate it to maybe a, a, a piece of original art versus a very well done replica that maybe only a very distinguished art expert could tell the difference between but most people are still going to want the original and the price of the original is going to be significantly more than the reproduction. So since the beginning of time, humans have wanted rare and valuable things like precious metals and precious gemstones. Um, and it's kind of hardwired in us and uh, it may not be practical, but um, it certainly exudes you know, um, emotions in, in us. So that scarcity or, or at least perceived scarcity, that's a big part of it. It's scarcer than a lab-grown diamond because a natural diamond is a non-renewable natural resource and a lab-grown diamond is a manufactured diamond. So theoretically, we could produce as many lab-grown diamonds as we want in you know, desired you know, shapes, colors, that sorts of thing. So the fundamentals of the supply are completely different and that's reflected in the price. Lab-grown diamonds and natural diamonds are chemically the same, but the ones that come out of a mine are finite in supply, cost more to get to the jeweller, and customers value them more highly. So are we looking at two separate markets? We're still kind of in this um, you know, novel phase, so I, I think there is um, a blend. But I think once the product fully matures um, and consumers know that it exists and they know exactly what it is and the price is kind of stabilized to their respective areas, I think they will be viewed and, and perceived as, as different products. And we've seen that with you know, other gemstone markets like the lab created you know, ruby, emerald, sapphire market versus the natural market for those colored gemstones. And the price points are, are very different. Um, and the consumers, um, you know, that buy them, you know, have, have different mm. ambitions in mind. So, so I, I do think we're going to get to that point. And, you know, from a consumer standpoint, I would just look at it as a, it's a different option. Cormac Kinney thinks this process of becoming two markets is further along. That's already started. So at the wholesale, there's really almost no connection between the prices. There used to be a discount 
you know, lab grown were priced relative to natural and it was a 30% discount, then 40, then 50. Now that you have a 99% discount from natural, it's no longer a yardstick that can be used as a reference. So now the lab grown producers are marking their diamonds up based on cost and they're desperate. They've actually, several of them have gone bankrupt in the last eight months and they just have to move these lab grown diamonds. So they're selling them direct to consumers and exposing the actual cost. And that's why consumers are starting to realize they're just not worth it. But they're the same thing, aren't they? They are chemically the same as a mine diamond. The, the, the mine diamond takes, I don't know, maybe millions of years of pressure and heat to force into what we know as a natural diamond. But what they do in the lab, you end up with the carbon atoms in the same alignment. You end up with more or less, well, the same thing. Chemically, that's true. But the difference is scarcity. Because of that natural process, because they take millions of years, and because they take billions of dollars to extract and mine and process, and that process, by the way, creates jobs, it pays taxes, it consumes capital, that's economic substance behind natural diamonds, and that inherently makes them valuable, not just today, but forever. You cannot replicate something that requires economic substance with with something you can just print. What a lot of people don't realize is that it's extremely easy for a gem lab to tell the difference between a natural diamond and a lab-grown diamond. The difference is in the crystal lattice of the actual atomic structure of the gem. You can imagine that a, a diamond that grows over a half million years has a different crystalline structure than one that grows under under pressure over six weeks. And that technology to detect lab-grown diamonds has uh, proliferated. Now it's $10,000 for, for that kind of equipment, and it's coming down fast. So really only, as the diamond industry likes to say, real is rare. And that's what's going to, I think, maintain the value of natural diamonds over time. Somebody's put it to me that a lot of industries have been disrupted in the last 30 years by technology. Could diamonds be? I mean, I know your, your business is really all about that mined natural diamond, but couldn't technology be doing the same thing again? I don't think so. And it's, it's you know, there's great technology to make fake Rolex watches. And you can look at 100 YouTube uh, videos of uh, a super clone of a Rolex watch. And they've been around for many, many years. You, with your eye and your magnifier, you couldn't tell the difference of, with that either. Rolex is at all time highs of production and, and sales price. And the same thing is true with, with Chanel handbags and Louis Vuitton purses. It, it real is what the, uh, is what holds its value. And I think that'll be the same with diamonds. Thanks to Cormac Kinney, the founder and CEO of Diamond Standard. You also heard from independent diamond industry analyst, Paul Zimniski, Talitha Cummins who runs The Cut Jewelry, and her extremely happy customer, Eloise Sawyer. The money comes to you from Gadigal Land, Sydney. 